All right, I see uh, folks entering the Zoom room. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Morgan. I'm an event manager at Politics and Pros, and I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. Soon, I will drop a link in the chat for where you can order a copy of The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women, straight from PNP's website. You can ask our speakers a question by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can toward the end of the program. But we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address your question. Also, there are auto captions for this event by hitting the live caption button at the bottom of your screen. Let's introduce tonight's guest. Marita Golden is the author of 17 works of fiction and nonfiction. She is the recipient of many awards, including the Writers for Writers Award presented by Barnes and Noble and Poets and Writers, just to name a few. Co-founder and President Emeritus of the Zora Neale Hurston slash Richard Wright Foundation, Marita Golden, is a veteran teacher of writing. Golden will be in conversation with Dolan Perkins Valdez, the New York Times bestselling author of Winch and Balm. Her forthcoming novel, Take My Hand, will be published by Berkeley Books slash Penguin Random House in April, 2022. Dolan is the current chair of the board of the Penn Faulkner Foundation and is associate professor in, literature, in the literature department at American University in Washington, DC. Please give our guest a virtual round of applause. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here tonight. Politics and Prose is kind of a home for me. Kind of every time I have a book out, I find myself at Politics and Prose, and I love the Politics and Prose people. I'm really glad to be on this program with Dolan, whose work I've admired for a really long time. And in her novels, she really does a great job of exploring the emotional lives of Black women. So I think we're gonna have a, a really great conversation. So The Strong Black Woman, before I read a few uh, sections from the book, I kind of want to start with a definition. The Strong Black Woman complex is a deeply embedded cultural belief in the African-American community. It's kind of a belief that I like to say has a chokehold on our culture. It's a belief that Black women are strong, have to be strong, are resilient, and have to be strong and resilient in all situations. The roots of it, of course, are in our enslavement, where we were considered and treated like chattels, like animals. And because of that, we were designated as strong, physically strong, emotionally strong, and we responded by being that way. And we did what many oppressed groups do, that is we took the language that was meant to diminish us and turned it into language that we could use to inspire and uplift us. So our culture, our folklore, our songs, our poetry is all infused with the mythology of the super strong, nearly invincible black woman who's the backbone of her community and who sacrifices her emotional health for that community. This of course is a dangerous belief. It's a dangerous mythology because what it does is it puts black women on emotional lockdown and we end up censoring the natural expression of human emotions like uncertainty, fear, and even asking for help. It endangers our physical health because holding in all those emotions has a toxic impact on our body. African-American women right now are in the midst of a health emergency. Four out of five black women are obese or overweight. The fastest growing segment of the population that's developing dementia is black women. We have very high rates of diabetes, um, heart attack and stroke. And while we know that part of this is because of a long history of segregation, uh, lack of access, Part of it also is the fact that because of the strong black women conflicts, we simply do not prioritize self-care. The strong black woman complex also corrupts our relationships with other people. When you add to that systemic racism, macro, micro, 24 hours a day, you have a toxic brew, a toxic situation where 
Black women are receiving constant pressure and because they so often do not prioritize self-care, they do not have the practices that would allow them to release stress and to give their bodies and their minds a fighting chance to survive. We are dying because we're Black and we really don't have to. This is a book that kind of was my pandemic project. I wrote it in March. I started writing in March of uh, 2020 and finished in September of 2020. And I kind of wrote it um, almost with a sense of real urgency after I had had kind of a health scare that made me reassess my life and uh, the lives of Black women around the issue of health. I had seen my parents die when I was 21 and 23. And at that age, uh, launched a very serious regimen, uh, exercise, the right diet, vegetarianism, yoga, meditation, everything you can think of. And because I had stroke in my genes, I found out that I'd had two silent strokes sometime in the past. The good news is that if I had not had such a very serious health regimen, those two strokes might have been fatal or very, very serious. So after I found that out, I went on the internet and started researching what are people saying about Black women's health? And I saw a very vibrant conversation that I wanted to be part of. So this is a book that is part memoir, part journalism, part essay, part literary criticism. I interview health advocates, health professionals, and I interview Black women about healing and trauma and I particularly wanted to destigmatize the conversation about therapy. So I'm going to read up first a section that deals with, with me. And then I'm going to read a section from one of the women who very generously shared her story with me. I was 21 years old and my mother was dying. She lay comatose in a bed in a rehabilitation center for six months, wasting away before my eyes. I was a raise of black power fist, Afro wearing militant activist and B plus average student attending American University. And I had already started wearing the mask, the strong woman mask. I was 21 and already I was a strong black woman. Being a strong black woman meant that you handled your business. You did what you had to do no matter what. My mother was dying, but I had to continue to be a successful student. Being a strong black woman meant that you didn't bother others unnecessarily with your pain. In the small apartment where I lived with my mother, my nights were sleepless, tear-filled meltdowns, meltdowns, in which in the dark I whispered, shouted, and screamed the questions I was terrified to ask in the light of day. Why would I soon be a motherless child? and how would I go on? I'd rarely seen, rarely if ever seen my mother cry. Maybe she too cried in the dark. How I wish she had cried in the light. Despite all that she'd made of her life after her arrival in Washington, DC, as part of the great migration of African-Americans from the South, there was a lot she could have cried about. And I write about um, keeping in, holding in the fact that I was experiencing this really great trauma in my life. And recently I had a conversation with a 10 year old member of our family who had lost her stepfather. And I tried to comfort her and I asked her about her feelings. And I said, you've probably cried a lot. And she said, no, Aunt Marita, I haven't cried. I can't cry, I'm holding it in. And I was so hurt because at 10 years old, She's already become a strong black woman. And so I knew that my task going forward with this young member of our family is every time I'm in her presence to find some way to give her permission to talk about her feelings, to express her deepest emotions. As I said, one of the most satisfying parts of doing this book was to talk about black women, talk to black women about the strong black woman complex. Uh, who are the strong black women in their families? who taught them to be strong black women and what did they have to unlearn 
from what they were taught. One of the women who shared her stories, her story with me, grew up in upstate Pennsylvania. She was put up for adoption by her white mother. And uh, she had a white mother and a black father. And she was adopted by a white family. And even though this family was in some ways loving and supportive, she experienced tremendous racism in the town and in the school environment in which she was educated. Uh, real marginalization, um, just verbal and emotional racist abuse. Her adoptive family refused to acknowledge it or talk about it. And she shared part of, she shared her story with me and I'm going to read to you what she told me about recovering from that. I was bright, curious, eager to learn, but all that got shut down. Somehow after high school, I got into Temple University in Philly. At Temple, I discovered black literature and the poet Sonia Sanchez, a professor in the English department. Those two things saved my life. Reading James Baldwin and all the other black writers, I realized that I belonged to a people who had walked tall despite oppression. Sometimes sitting in the library, those books brought me to tears because I had found my home. Those stories taught me racism wasn't a personal vendetta against me. It was historical, it was cultural. I realized that enduring all that had happened to me, the actions against me at school and the silence of my parents was me standing in the river of history getting dumped. But Giovanni and Jordan and Lord and Walker showed me that I had not gone down to stay forever. I was still getting high because that's what I did. That's how I survived. But I just latched on to Professor Sanchez. I took all her classes. And one day she asked me the question that if you hear it at the right moment changes your life. She asked what I was going to do with myself. I just blurted out, I wanna do what you do. She didn't laugh at me. She just told me in order to do what she did, I'd have to go to Howard University for graduate school. I was burnt out, but at the same time inspired. And I applied for Howard's black literature program and got in because of her shepherding. And that was when I finally got clear, woke up and asked myself what Sonia had asked me, what was I going to do? What was I going to do with a life that I didn't feel anymore that I had to run from, but a life that I could hold in my hands? So now I had this life, this real life that was staring me in the face and I could see it up close, see it for real because I stopped using drugs. But without the drugs, I was all rage. If somebody pissed me off, I got physical immediately. My anger drove away my boyfriend and almost destroyed friendships. It was crazy, but it was kind of exhilarating. I had tapped down the anger I felt for so long, masked it with the drugs, that once I started feeling the anger and expressing it, I almost couldn't stop. I had girlfriends who were worried about me and urged me to get therapy because I clearly had anger management problems. The most important thing I learned in therapy is what happened to me growing up. It's like I'd been in a war. It felt like a war against me, but no one ever used that word. I'd been traumatized and I wasn't just angry. I had post-traumatic stress disorder. All that seems far away and yet it's all right here with me. I'm married now and I have a son because I had to be so strong, I realized that a part of me never respected people who couldn't handle things. I tend to take on a lot and out of habit to shoulder things and then end up feeling burdened. I'm a workaholic, but there's so many life rafts now. My husband, my son, my writing, my teaching, martial arts, and plain old prayer gets me through more days than I can count. And after I had completed that interview, I finished the book. And recently I, 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 kind of, I saw this, this woman and I said to her, I said, you know, I see a disconnect. I see a disconnect between the power of your writing, your passion for teaching and how you present yourself in the world. I don't know what's going on, but your energy is, is off. And she accepted my comment. She didn't get upset. And a couple, about, about six months later, 
she sent me an email and she said, thank you, Marita. Thank you for saying those words. Because what you were seeing was the fact that even though in the past I had developed coping strategies, ways to relieve stress, because of COVID, my life changed so much. I was homeschooling my son. I had started a PhD program and I was feeling absolutely overwhelmed. And you picked up on that and you saw the disconnect. And I'm now back in therapy and I wanna thank you for what you said. And I really appreciated that because it confirmed to me that those of us who are engaged in serious practices to sustain our physical and mental health have to reach out to our sisters who are not. And there are many loving and supportive ways to do that. Thank you. Wow, thank you for sharing that story. That was definitely, uh, there were some powerful stories in there. That was one of the more powerful. Thank you, Marita, for being here with us tonight. I have my copy here. As I said earlier, <laughs> I curled up in my reading chair and I read every single word. I felt like I could hear your voice as I was reading it, like you were talking to me. Good. You, you mentioned that uh, the book is a hybrid form, that it's part memoir, and it is, it's part memoir, it's part, I don't know, self-help book, I felt like it's sure. part, like you say, there's a chapter on literature, there's um, these interviews, there's all of these different, you know, part, you, know you, you, you move into these historical voices of women like Fannie Lou Hamer. Can you talk to us just a little bit about how you decided on the form this book would take? Well, this is a form that I call communal memoir. And it's the same structure that I used when I wrote my book, Saving Our Sons, Raising Black Children in a Turbulent World. And it's the same structure I used when I wrote, Don't Play in the Sun, One Woman's Journey Through the Color Complex. And it's important for me, it was important for me because I was tackling this kind of story. I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm a black woman and I'm a storyteller. And I had to use my voice. I couldn't speak in the voice of a therapist. I could speak in the voice of a storyteller. I could speak in the voice of a woman who has traveled through being a strong black woman into a new age, strong black woman. So I simply said, how can I tell this story? And I had to do multiple things. I had to make the case by, yes, speaking to therapists, speaking to doctors. I had to provide some statistics, but I didn't want the book to be all about how difficult it is to be a Black woman. I wanted to provide uplift. So there's a section on the healing power of stories, the stories that we read, the stories that our parents and families tell us. And I really knew that it was going to be very important to center the voices of other Black women who were brave enough to tell their stories of healing and trauma and wholeness. So it is like a quilt because this is a subject that has very many pieces to it. Communal memoir, that's the term you Communal use? memoir. Oh, communal memoir, okay, okay. That's good, I've never heard of that. I invented it. <laughs> you did? Okay, I'll have to credit you when I repeat this now. Um, so you did a lot of research. I know you said you didn't want it to just be about the research. You did do a lot of research here. Was there anything that surprised you that you found? Well, I think the thing that shocked me the most was when I uh, read an article by Dr. Kanika Bell, who's a psychologist down in Atlanta, and she had contributed an essay to um, a book about Black women's strength. And um, she conducted a study, a survey of a group of Black women therapists, psychologists who treated other Black women. And the results of the study were that for many Black women, the Black women who were being treated and the Black women therapists, the idea that peace of mind, contentment and happiness was something that Black women had a right to was absolutely foreign. Many of the women wrote on the survey that that's for white women. 
that we are so overwhelmed with dealing with racist, racism and living in a hostile environment that we derelict our duty. We're in dereliction of our duty to our families if we focus on happiness, contentment, and peace of mind. And I was absolutely shocked. But then, you know, I thought about there have been some times when I had deprioritized self-care. Mm -hmm. But it's very that's a very, very troubling belief. And I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who works with, with Black women around weight loss. And she did an exercise in her workshop where she asked the women to write about their happy place, that place or that space that made them happy. They couldn't name a single place or space where they felt happy. And that is absolutely frightening because Black women do have a right to be happy. I was just so glad to find out recently that Rosa Parks did yoga. Rosa Parks was a Buddhist and that we have a long tradition outside the black church and praying to Jesus in terms of seeking healing and comfort and solace. What's your happy place, Marita? What's your... <laughs> I, I was so, um, in, I didn't know, like when you began the book, you talked about how after your mother's passing, you had prioritized your own health and that you were determined to live a longer life than she had and that you were also determined to have a better quality of life than she had had. What, what are some of your rituals that you do? I'm just curious. Well, first, I want to say that it's a lifelong journey. And you don't get to one place and you're set. These are things that I do every day regularly to maintain some sense of balance. Um, I've been meditating since I was in my 20s. I started out with transcendental meditation. Now I do mindfulness. And I think it's very hard for, one of the things I say is that Black women need to say hello to themselves. We need a space, a place that's just ours. Then everything to do with our family, our husbands, our jobs, that's just ours where we can meet our sister self. And in meditation, in stillness, I do days of silence. Um, sometimes I'll go away for a weekend retreat. Uh, sometimes I'll just wake up and I'll tell my husband, today is a me day. And he said, look, you need to give me 24 hours notice. <laughs> so I find that just taking time for me, I walk, um, I, I exercise, and that really keeps me healthy in mind and spirit. I have a very wide network of friends of all ages. And I'm in fact getting to the point now where I most of my friends are, are 20 years younger than me. Uh, I went to Chesapeake Beach last Friday, spent the day with, with one of my friends. I, I actively seek opportunities to celebrate myself. And my laugh is one of my happy places too. You notice I keep laughing? Yeah. That gives me a boost. So I've been doing these things over much of my life and they have really sustaining. And also I go to therapy. I've been in therapy a couple of times because I was facing a crisis that I couldn't handle. And so just as the woman whose story I read had been in therapy, but she found that she needed therapeutic support again. And I think that um, there's absolutely nothing, nothing wrong with that. In fact, therapy helped get me ready to meet my husband, my soulmate. In fact, one day, uh, this therapist, Audrey Chapman, called the house. I guess we've been married about three or four years. And he says, is that Audrey Chapman? Let me speak to her. And he, he said, Audrey Chapman, thank you. Thank you for getting my wife <laughs> together for me. So I think that there's just a rate. And, and this is such an important moment because we're the first group of Black women to in our 20s, 30s, 40s, who are all ready to smash this dangerous and toxic belief. 
you know, one of the things that's really clear in this book and, and, and and really, I think I needed to read this book right now. I'm going to be honest with you, Marita. One of the things that's really clear through all of those women who you interview is that if we don't deal with our stuff, whatever that may be, whether it be um, rape, whether it be um, our grief over losing someone, um, whether it be all kinds of other trauma, like if we don't deal with our stuff, it is going to fester. We cannot just put it under the rug and think it's not, not gonna manifest itself in our lives. And it's, it, it's, it's going to kill us. I did a program. This is really, um, I think this book, everybody should read this book. And it's a book for black women. It's a book for anybody who loves Black women. It's a book for Black men so they can understand Black women. It's a book for white people who want to be our allies. So this is a book for, for literally everybody. And the point to follow up on what you just, the point you just raised is not dealing with this is literally killing us. So often I did a program with um, Dr. Uh, Georgia Wiley Carnegie, who's a cardiologist at Washington Hospital Center. And she talked about the fact that she sees in the emergency room, African-American women will come at the last minute. They will take, make sure that if their son has a problem, bam, emergency room. If their husband, bam. But if there's something, oh, oh, it'll go away. And by the time they show up, sometimes it's too late. Often in, in African-American families, we don't know our medical history. So many black people don't talk about the genealogy of their history. Um, my grandmother died of this. My grandfather died of this. And, and the, 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 the really frightening thing was that Dr. Carnegie said that studies have been done that show that women, Black, African descended women all over the world do not talk about health. They don't talk about their health. They don't talk about their family's health. And so there's this huge deficit and we've got to start We've got to start talking about it. I love when you said that, that we have to destigmatize talking about our health and that we can talk about our health in healthy ways, right? That are positive and affirming, but yet we're still communicating and being open about them. So like you have this chapter on weight and black women and obesity. Um, and I loved how you framed it as, okay, on the one hand, we want to celebrate our bodies and, you know, we, we want to love ourselves and not everybody who is overweight is unhealthy. We get that, right? But some people who are overweight are, are. unhealthy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so I love how you, you gave this message in, in love. In love. And I'm going to tell you, that was the hardest chapter to write. I bet I'm going to be very was. frank with you. I wrote the first draft and I said, people are gonna say, you skinny bitch, who are you to talk to people about weight? And I then had a friend who's a little chubby read it. And she says, well, Rita, I, I think you could use some different language. And then I had another person read it. And she says, well, I think you're on the mark. And then I had to say to myself, Marita, are you writing this chapter from compassion and love, as well as authentic honesty and the need to sound the alarm. If you're doing all those four things, you're okay. And I kept refining and refining. That's why there's this, I think that's a chapter where I take two imaginary black women, one uh, a high white collar sister and a blue collar sister. And I talk about the stresses and strains and the reasons that may, they may not be eating healthy and doing the things that they have to do. But even um, those are the kinds of women that need their sister friends to say, hey, why don't you go to walk with me today? Okay, let's just take a walk, start small. And you even in the book, give us resources. Like I didn't know about this organization, Girls Trek, oh, yeah. which is, you know, black women who walk across the country. And, you know, there have been, um, lots, but one of the things you said in that chapter, which I was, I, I giggled at a little bit as a person married to a black man is like how black men love 
fleshy women. And you said, I don't know anybody who will tell their wives, you know, don't go under 200 pounds because Th- that, that, <laughs> that, that was a quote. That's a that's a quote from an article that Alice Randall did. Oh yes, about, Alice Randall. Yeah, about her struggle with weight. And she said that her husband had said, you know, don't lose too much weight. I don't want you to lose your butt. I don't want you to lose this. I don't want you to lose that. So we get these conflicting messages. And then for younger black women, they go online on social media and then they see the Brazilian butt. And then they see the the anorexic, all these, and then they're on Instagram. So it's very, very confusing and toxic for them. But the main thing is health. Right. you, You know, until you've been to your doctor and your doctors told you you're not pre-diabetic, you're not pre-stroke. You can't guess about that. Right. And the thing about weight is uh, one of the women that I've been doing these programs with has written a book called Leaving Large about her struggle with weight during her lifetime. And she ate because of a childhood trauma that she was seeking to overcome. And in her lifetime, she lost 700 pounds. That is yo-yo, yo-yo dieting, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And um, she said, you know, Marita, I'd go to the doctor and I wasn't pre-diabetic. I wasn't pre-stroke until I was. And when I got pre-diabetic and pre-stroke, I was really pre-diabetic and pre-stroke and he had to put me on all kinds of medication. So, you know, it's easy to say, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm overweight, but I'm not pre-diabetic. I'm not pre-stroke. Did your doctor tell you that? Mm -hmm. We have to get real. And let me ask you, because it it sometimes feels like, um, you know, part of the stereotype of the strong Black woman is rooted in that body type, right? Like in those old images of Mammy, she's fist fighting people, right? And so, you know, my question is, some of these uh, ideologies of strong Black womanhood are so pervasive and so deep we don't even realize it they're 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 consistent i mean if you're watching um uh, your favorite tv show give it time a domineering take no prisoners black woman will sooner or later be introduced into that show she's bossy she's domineering and if they if there's a conscience of the writers they will make it so that nobody likes her at first because she's so dominant and bossy, mm-hmm. but then she's, she, she melts down and she becomes likable. But the domineering, bossy, take her, and it doesn't matter her size, and it doesn't matter her complexion, that trope is all over, unless, of course, you're looking at Queen Sugar, unless, of course, you're looking at a program that has Black showrunners which is not the majority of shows, or unless you're looking at This Is Us. But anyway, I'm through promoting my favorite shows. But it's still a very, very pervasive trope. So that Black women are not fist fighting anybody, but they're fist fighting with their aura, with their persona. That's fascinating. So how do we, how do we break free of this city? How can we all be a part of the process of change? Well, I'm, I'm very glad to say that there's a small army of writers, scholars, thinkers, uh, public policy, public health people who are very, very concerned about this. Um, and what we can do in our individual lives is to start small, take a walk, start walking, figure out how you can celebrate yourself. And for Black women, that's huge. Take some time just for you. Um, I did a program with Dr. Pamela Brewer, and she said that when she tells Black women to do that, to find a space in their home where they can just sit and be quiet, 
she said, well, they're afraid to tell the family or the family won't say yes. So then you sit down and you tell the family, look, you know, this is the way it's got to be. And this isn't just about me, it's about the family and how I can live longer and survive to be part of this family. And you have to invest the whole family in your wealthy. I mean, for example, I asked my son if he'd ever remember seeing me cry. That's in the book. And he said, yes. And it was at a time when he was a teenager, this was many years ago. And as teenagers, he did something stupid, gotten situation and we had to get him out. And he saw me cry. And I said, what did that say to you? He said, well, it said to me that you weren't invincible. It said that um, you couldn't solve all my problems and that I had to take responsibility for my actions. Mm -hmm. And when black women are always the answer, the ATM, the therapist, we disempower those around us. Wow, that's deep. We disempower them. We think we're helping, but we're not. And you're going to get pushback, but they'll get over it. <laughs> you know, one of the things, and this is how I know that I need my me time. I have started carrying a chair, a folding chair in the trunk of my car. Mm -hmm. And every now and then I will just pull over mm -hmm. and take my chair out of the trunk. Good for you. And sit. Good for you. Mm -hmm. so you're Usually a, somewhere in Rock Creek Park good or good somewhere, you. you know, near the, anywhere I can park legally, I would just pull, like not with no planning and no exactly. forethought, just pull over, take exactly. my chair out and sit for a minute. But you believe that you have the right to do that, that you have the right to have quiet time. Mm -hmm. So though, as I say, once again, those of us who are actively engaged in these practices, we have to see talking to other sisters who are not as part of our job. One of the women mm -hmm. talked about uh, going into therapy and sharing with her friends. She, got, she said, I got so comfortable with being in therapy that I could talk to my friends about it. And she said her friends would come up to her on the down low, you know, on the side when nobody could see them. Say, you know, uh, thank you for saying that. You know, I always wanted to go into therapy. What's it like? So just those kinds of conversations can have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. So we have to be angel warriors for each other. Well, I wanna just encourage, we're gonna talk a few more minutes, but I wanna encourage everybody to put your questions in the chat. I'm gonna ask the first question that's here and anybody else has a question, please, please tell us. Um, this person, uh, Joanne Jackson, wants to know, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Did any of your research address the high rate of domestic violence toward Black women? Well, yeah, Black women are more likely to be raped, to be physically abused, to be killed by a partner than other women, except Native Americans. We're always sort of in the white-Black comparison, but actually Native American women have the worst statistics for health as well as physical abuse. But um, I do address that. And we know that we live in communities that are under enormous stress. We live in communities where many, many people are walking wounded and hurt people hurt people and hurt people sometimes kill people. Um, you, uh, you had a section in there where you talked about some research you did years ago where you interviewed the men who, who were in prison for rape and how you, was. I think it was an Essence article you were doing in the early 70s and how yes, yes, you, yes. you were struck by how broken they were and their rage. I, I thought, I gotta go look that article up. I meant to say y'all put the questions in the Q&A, not the chat, the Q&A, I think I said chat. Um, tell us, you, you, you talk about at the, at the end of the book, I love that you have these women that you quote who tell about their favorite books that they, that have been powerful for them. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what anybody says. Books have been an anchor for me in the storms of my life. I mean, when I have been in my lowest place, 
I have disappeared into a book um, and they have healed me. Words have healed me. I can, I can really testify to that. I want you to tell me about how stories have healed you. And you mentioned in the book about, you know, your mom and your dad who helped you to develop as a writer and who told you stories, but how, how have narratives healed you? Well, my mother's stories were about how I was going to be a writer. And so that's a very powerful narrative to unfold for your child. When you yourself, you know, have no writing aspirations, but you see something in your child. So her narrative, the story that she told me of who I was going to be was aspirational. My father's stories were instructive about who I had come from so that my bedtime stories were about Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass. And uh, by the time I was 12, I knew J.A. Rogers, George Washington Williams, who wrote the first book of African American, all because of my father. So the fact is we're all, parents are always telling their, their, their children a story. They're not aware of it, but they're telling them a story of who they are and who they're going to be. So I had these aspirational stories that I grew up with. And then um, coming of age in the late 60s, early 70s, when there was this explosion of black women writers, I sort of cut my teeth, so to speak, on complex multidimensional stories about black women. So then when I realized that I was going to be a storyteller too, I had stood on, on those women's shoulders, so to speak. But writing is terribly healing. I mean, whenever I'm, facing a problem, I go to Barnes and Noble or Politics and Prose. Where can I find me a book that's going to help me through this? I mean, recently a friend had lost her husband and um, she's a writer also. And I was looking for a book that would be helpful for her. Um, and I couldn't find quite the right book, but I just, you know how you're rambling in the bookstore and you find a book, a book called The Five Invitations which is written by um, a guy who started the first Zen hospice uh, about a couple of decades ago. And it's so the five in invitations, uh, the spiritual invitations to life and, and death. And I devoured the book and it helped me understand what I needed to give my friend. I didn't give her that book, but that book helped me be a better friend to her as she was grieving. I love how you can just stumble on a book in a bookstore. Oh God, isn't that That's great? like the best? Isn't okay, that great? it is so awesome. Great? So we have three questions now. So first one from Lisa Gordon Kane: With so much misdiagnosis and the propensity to medicate symptoms, are there other suggestive methods of treatment that you promote? I'm a holistic mental health practitioner. So I am biased from the damage by many of my clinical practitioners. Well, I think that people have to find what works for them. One of the most um, moving stories in the book is a story told by a woman who grew up in Washington, DC during the worst of the, the period of the crack wars. And she lost, her, her father was killed before she was born. She lost an uncle, a brother, and a lover, and went to a school where she saw many of her friends killed. So she was surrounded by death, grief, grieving, mostly untreated. And whereas a number of the women in the book talk about having gone to therapy and it worked for them, it was very successful, she did not have that experience. Uh, she found that, she said, one woman told me, I just needed to pray. This is a therapist, I just need to pray. Uh, the second therapist asked, do you go to church on Sunday? The third therapist um, said, um, we'll be through this, we'll, we'll, you just need a couple of visits. So you have to stay with it to find the right person. But yeah. she ultimately did not find therapy. What she found was the love of her daughter. She had a daughter 
And she decided that for my daughter, I've got to get well. I've got to get healthy. I've got to get my life together. And so this woman who had been kicked out of school, um, went to get her GED. She ended up going to community college, went to college to get a degree. I talked to her today. She's working on her PhD. Her focus was living, becoming the best person she could be for her child. And that became this kind of vitamin pill or drug, a good drug that empowered her to change her life. So I think that everybody has to find what works for them. And um, that is one of the reasons that a lot of black women do not seek therapy because they know that they may be misdiagnosed. They know that they may be over medicated because of the long tradition of that. So you have to seek and, and stay with it or find what works for you. I'm gonna ask uh, this next question because it's directly related to that and you sort of all already answered it, but I wanna get it in. I'm a 30 year old black woman and I'm in therapy along with all of my girlfriends. We all have seen resistance from the older black women in our families about therapy when we suggest it to them to try it out or to at least open up about their emotional lives. Should we continue to encourage them to try therapy or should we accept their resistance? I think that if all of you are in therapy together, that's great. And right now, I think you ought to work on yourself. Mm. Um, I think it's very easy when we become sort of like true believers, we want to go out and spread the gospel. You may not be able to have success with the older women in your family, but maybe there's another sister your age who needs to hear that conversation. Well, you said to me earlier that this shift is generational, right? This is going to take a generation to shift this. I'm not saying give up on the older women, but but but, but then there are a lot of older black women who are in therapy. That's true too. Yes, and you have to under, you have to respect people where they are. Yeah. And it's not a contest. I mean, you're not selling Amway. You don't get a commission for every Black woman that you convince to go into therapy. So I think right now, focus on yourself. You're powerful. And the fact that people resist does not always mean that they haven't heard you. Woo, powerful. Doesn't mean that they haven't heard you. It just means that they're not ready. Mm -hmm. And you have to give people time. So, you know, and also I would say the younger generation is more open to telling people that they're in therapy, but sometimes older people can be in counseling and not share that with you, maybe with in their church or in exactly. some other uh, group that they're in. So sometimes they just don't talk about right. being That's in therapy a good point. in a way that younger people do, you know. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, Margie Lightoff says, I have several strong Black women in my life whom I admire. How do you achieve the balance between being vulnerable, taking care of yourself, and remaining strong in a healthy way? Well, vulnerability for me, to me, is part of strength. Um, the funny thing is that this book, the original title, <laughs> working title was Black Does Crack. Mm -hmm. Strong Black Women, How They Hurt, How They Heal. And my publishers just said, wait a minute, Marita. We're going to have real problems with that title. People will put that in and they'll think it's about drugs. But uh, somebody asked me in one interview, um, did I completely reject the phrase Black don't crack? So I said, well, no. I mean, somebody came up to me and said, you know, you look really good. Um, and say they found out my age and they said, oh, as, as often as, oh, you look really good, quote, for your age, black don't crack. And I'd say, no problem. But then I'd say, you know, what? one of the reasons I look so good is because see all this, this is cracked more times than you could even know. Mm -hmm. And part of my beauty is the fact that it has been repaired and the repairs have given me the beauty and the radiance that you see. Not just that I'm made of steel, uh, because I think the last sentence in the book is that we want a strength 
that's not made of stone, but that's elastic. So we get to redefine what strength is. And for me, vulnerability, the, the ability to cry. Mm -hmm. Tears are enormously powerful as a stress reliever. So we get, to, we get to define this. We don't have to operate on the traditional definitions of strength. We can redefine it for ourselves. Exactly, exactly. So our friend, uh, Tina McElroy Ansa is here. And she, Hi, Tina. Hi, Tina. <laughs> we love you. She wants to know, can you speak again, read Black women not having a happy place? Frightening. Now we know Tina's happy place is oh, her God, garden. Yeah. Her yeah, garden. Yeah, yeah. She inspires me with that garden, but can she wants you to speak a little bit more on what that. Well, it's, it's, it's devastating because it means that we're, we're really not whole. We're only accessing those emotions that are connected to stress, anxiety, managing, striving, working. And we have really got to start having conversations and say that happy is not a four letter word. Happiness is not a four letter word. And it's really, really deeply entrenched in our community. And uh, I mean, for example, even among writers, um, I, I often talk to, in my classes where I'm working with writers, I say that, you know, writers are the most erotic people on earth. We, we put off all celebration. Oh, well, I can't celebrate myself as a writer until I finish the book. And that's four years away. No, I celebrate myself all during the process. My last novel, uh, The White Circumference of Love, when I finished a pretty strong draft and sent it off to my agent and she got back to me with her comments, I was so pleased with myself that I bought tickets to the Universal Circus and went to the Universal Circus just like a little kid with my husband and had the best time. And so I do not put off any excuse to celebrate, but that's from years of, 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 of learning how to do that. And it really started with my practice of stillness and meditation and meeting myself, meeting my inner Marita and how beautiful and wonderful she is and how much she deserves. So I think that if black women could just be still, could just have some time to themselves, they'd meet this wonderful person who deserves to be happy. So much that you're saying, so much um, that we cannot even pack, unpack. So my friend uh, and mentor, uh, Professor Barbara Rhodes from California is here and wants to know the name of the book again. And I'm wondering which book. So Professor Rhodes, if you could ask, which tell us which specific book you're asking about. Marita's book is The Strong Black Woman, but I'm wondering if you mean a book that we mentioned. So if you could type that into the Q&A, we will make sure to answer. I that. hope she's talking about the book that's right behind me. <laughs> I think that's what she's talking about. But maybe there was a book we mentioned. Um, I can't remember in our discussion. And, speak, and, yeah, and speaking of books, um, as I was finishing the book, and I finished the book writing about stories and the power of healing stories, it was so wonderful for me to write probably for the 10th time about um, Their Eyes Are Watching God. And in writing that essay, I said, oh my God, Jamie Crawford was a new age, strong black woman. Mm -hmm. She prioritized joy. She asked for help. She, she valued friendship. All this time, I knew why I loved her. Now I have a new way to love her mm -hmm. because she was a new age, strong black woman. She was awesome. She was awesome. My daughter is in the ninth grade and is about to read the book this year. And I can't wait for her to read it so we can talk about it. Yes. Um, yes. So Professor Rose says the Zen approach to hospice patients. Oh, I know what she's talking about. The five invitations. Oh, the five invitations. Invitations, yeah, yeah. Here, I'll type the answer there. Uh -huh. 
So we have a couple more minutes if anybody else has another question. Marita, did, is there anything that you really want us to know before we end tonight? Or well, just, just take care of yourself, please. You know, find that happy, still, quiet place. Um, learn to say yes. Give yourself permission to say yes to what you really want to say yes to and no to what you really want to say no to. You'll, people will get over it. They'll be mad for a minute, but people will get over it and you will be so much stronger. And take care of your body. Go to the doctor. I don't care if it's a naturopath, holistic, go to the doctor. Your, your body deserves care. And you know, so much of it, uh, Marita, is finding good doctors, finding doctors who hear us. I've had doctors before that didn't hear a word I said. <laughs> well, go find another doctor. Yeah, and uh, finding a, a good, good therapist. A, a, yes, a good doctor listens. And you, for example, you're not if if you were shopping for food for your family. And you went, you had to go to several stores to find what you were looking for. You wouldn't stop at the third store and say, well, I'm going to go back home. Same thing with doctors. And yes, it is more challenging. It's really challenging for us as, as Black people and Black women. But, be, but that's exactly why we have to stay in it. And a good doctor is a doctor who listens. I have a very good friend who's a doctor and I read his reviews one time, uh, I was gonna tease him, but his reviews were all good. And the number one thing they said about him is that he listens to me. That was the number one reason why he was getting these rave reviews online. You think something that simple would be, everybody would do it, but no, you know. Well. And congratulations, Dolan, I can't wait for your new book. Oh, thank you, Marita. Hopefully we'll be having this conversation, you know, about my book soon. I would love to yes. chat more with you about Black sure. women's health, yes. which, yes. you know, is something that we both are concerned about. So, Oh, yeah. Your book. Yeah. Yes. You're so brave. Well, you know, in the face of all that's going on in the world right now, it doesn't feel brave as much as it feels necessary. Mm -hmm. And I am just gonna, you know, yes. say to the people who are here tonight, buy this book. It's look at this. You can read it over the weekend. It is necessary. Some reading, y'all, is necessary. And this is one of those kind of books to me. Like I like I said, I sat there and I felt like you were talking directly to me, Marita. I, I was. I was. I had an image of you in my brain as How I was. How did she know I <laughs> need to hear this right now? How did you know that? <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Thank you, dear. And on uh, the behalf of Politics and Pearls, I'd like to thank you, uh, Marita Golden, for having this event with us. Uh, the thank book you. sounds really good, very informative. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Dolan for moderating this event with us as well. You all made a great event this evening. Um, I would also like to thank the audience for joining and tuning in. These events wouldn't be possible without your support. Uh, please purchase uh, The Strong Black Woman from Politics and Pros. The link is in the chat to buy it online. Our stores are open for in-person shopping. And I'd also like to wish you all a great Friday night. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs>